So what I'm doing today is I'm talking about the Industrial Revolution uh, that mostly peaked around the 19th century. So that's my main topic. Uh, of course, I'll be getting into today. Um, and um, of course, the continuation of the lecture I had before uh, on the 19th century. Of course, previous lecture I talked about uh, Europe and France. Yeah, France, Russia, mostly Europe, 19th century, what happened after Napoleon was exiled. I kind of went into that. Uh, of course, I'm going to be, of course, talking about this week, the Industrial Revolution. If I have any time, I'll get into the rise of socialism. If not, I'll kind of move that along to next week. But next week, I'm going to be more geared towards 20th century, uh, getting into topics like World War I will be one of my main things I'm going to, of course, be talking about. So some things I'm going to be getting into, which are, you know, very important, uh, more or less. So, um, so let's go ahead and talk about the um, Industrial Revolution. So, yeah, the Industrial Revolution started mostly in Europe. Uh, began, of course, uh, in Britain mostly, which I'll get to in a second about that. Uh, spread to the rest of Europe. Uh, went into the United States uh, and then North America, Canada, and all those other areas. Uh, and um, and then, of course, even spread to parts of Asia over time. And it's still spreading all over the world. The yeah, Industrial Revolution is still going, you know. I think that there's like a third or fourth one, I think, that's going on. Uh, however, we're mostly going to be talking about the first two uh, Industrial Revolutions uh, that mostly took place. Uh, I'll give you a definition of it. It's, there's just all kinds of ways that you can define what the Industrial Revolution was. But it's obviously a major transformation of world economies. You know, before the Industrial Revolution, most economies were, everything was produced by hand, like everything, whatever you're making or whatever, like shoes or clothing, everything was pretty much done by hand. And then what happened was you got this transformation from hand production to manufacturing processes where they start making things using like machines, assembly lines, uh, et cetera, machine tools, whatever. Uh, and so it led to obviously the rise of capitalism, which will start in Europe, spread the Americas into the rest of the world. And so industrial revolution and capitalism kind of go hand in hand uh, later on. And, um, also, it involved tech, new technologies. Don't forget about that. That's one of the things that led to the uh, Industrial Revolution. So you got all kinds of new innovations, manufacturing processes, inventions, machines, assembly lines, use of steam power, water power, electrical power later, coal, of course, industries, iron and steel industries, chemical processes, and so on, you know, and all kinds of different factories that came about, you know, over time. So all these are kind of involved in the whole industrial revolution that would eventually, you know, come in line. Uh, here's, of course, a slide later if you want to look at some of the major things that happened, of course, uh, in the industrial revolution. But uh, the industrial revolution itself started primarily uh, in Britain in the 18th century. Maybe it's kind of debated about when it was, like early to mid uh, 18th century, started in England and Scotland, mostly those two areas. Those are some of the first industrialized cities in the world, supposedly was in Britain and England, Scotland. They say Manchester, which is in England, was considered the first industrialized city in the world, but you didn't know that. Uh, London, Birmingham, Glasgow, and Scotland, uh, those were all examples of different cities that became the first to be industrialized. So the Britain and the British Empire is really the first, you know, country or nation uh, that really starts to industrialize uh, at that point. Um, and of course, it led to that, you know, if you know about the industrial growth and everything, it led to the uh, urbanization of all the cities. So you got this case where cities began to, you know, double, triple, quadruple in size, uh, more or less, because that's where all the industries eventually were developed. This happens everywhere, not just in Britain, but in Europe, uh, in the Americas, um, Africa, Asia. Uh, over time, 
most people live in cities and still do today, like in, in the United States. That's where most people live, uh, more or less. Uh, they do subdivide the Industrial Revolution into two sub-periods. You've got the uh, first Industrial Revolution, which started, it's kind of a debate when it was, but they think it started in the sometime in the 18th century, went up to about the mid-19th century, maybe around 1850 or so. Started in Britain in its empire, uh, and then in the second Industrial Revolution spread uh, to the rest of Europe, affected the United States, of course. We got start really getting into it in the 1800s. Asia, etc. I think Japan was one of the first countries to be industrialized. We read about it. Uh, and that they, usually the second industrial revolution goes up to like around World War One. So then it keeps going. I think I think pretty much the world's in like a third and fourth probably industrial revolution now, uh, more or less. But talk about Britain first. We need to get into in course talk because you know, like I said, Britain. In its empire was one of the first to really contribute to what became uh, the Industrial Revolution. And they think that the Industrial Revolution started because of farming changes or practices that started happening in, in England, Scotland, etc. And it was all kind of part of what started the kick started the whole Industrial Revolution. Uh, and it was later called the so-called uh, British Agricultural Revolution, which mostly occurred they think starting in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, overall. And uh, what happened in England was that England began to modernize its farming practices. Uh, so uh, before that, uh, England had this um, medieval farming system that they call the open field system that went back to hundreds of years ago. Uh, and uh, they used to have have the fields uh, divided like into like three fields. And I think what they would do is they would have one field that would lay fallow for the whole year and they would just rotate it every year. Well, with the boom in population, they couldn't do that. They had to, you know, grow all the fields and all of that. And so uh, that led to new kinds of later uh, farming innovations, uh, practices, also led to new uh, field system crop rotation type systems uh, that would come later. And one of the first things that happened, they think may have started way back in the 18th century, but uh, in England, they started enclosing all the lands, uh, which before they were like smaller lands, people, I guess, would raise crops or raise cattle. And uh, they consolidate all the lands into larger farming communities. So they would grow a lot of crop you know, and all that, and also raise a lot of cattle. Like if you talk about um, England, Scotland, they, they raise a lot of sheep uh, because of the wool industry starts really taking off 18th, 19th century uh, and all that. So because of all the larger farms uh, and all that, farmers were, were forced to basically adopt better, you know, agricultural practices, you know, could, to, you know to cut down on costs labor costs, production costs, you know, growing crops or raising cattle or whatever. And so it led to the surplus of workers that couldn't find work in the rural areas. So that meant that all the workers, all the people started fleeing the rural areas because they didn't have jobs. And so they went to the urbanized cities uh, where all the industries were. So that's why basically, you know, that came about. Uh, and so, uh, you can see they had to develop agricultural changes, you know, to continue farming practices uh, more or less. Uh, and so that led to um, what is scientific farming, more or less, uh, where they had to rely on various new techniques uh, to grow crops. You start seeing this a lot, especially by the 1800s. So new technologies came about mechanized equipment, you know, to plant crops or harvest crops, you know, and things like that uh, were used. New kinds of fertilizers came about. They started using different kinds of chemicals, uh, whether for fertilizers or to, you know, insecticides and things like that uh, that would come about later. Selective breeding of cattle is something you'll start seeing in the 1800s uh, also as well, where they'll take the best bull and they'll breed them with their uh you know, cattle, or cows and all that. Uh, and so those are all different things that are going to start happening in the 
in 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 the agricultural revolution. This happens. And I don't. This in you know Britain, but happens in the rest of Europe and happens in the United States and other parts of the world. They start modernizing agricultural practices and pretty much that's the way it is today. Uh, so not too. It doesn't take too many people to farm anymore uh, because of all this new mechanized stuff they have. Uh, and of course, in Louisiana, where we're at, um, agriculture is the second biggest part of our economy uh, behind the petrochemical industry. Uh, so now um, talk about examples of farming innovations. Uh, examples, of course, would be this uh, English farmer and agriculturalist that lived kind of at the turn of the 18th century named Jethro Tull. You may have heard of him. There's a famous rock band in, in England that's named after him, of course, later. But uh, the original Jethro Tull was a farmer uh, who came up with new kinds of innovations to make farming easier. And first thing he came up with that's famous is the so-called horse-drawn seed drill, uh, which used a horse. And so it'd go across a field and it would basically mechanically bear, uh, you know, bury your seed uh, to, to grow crops. So that's what they kind of do today. They still have this today, these kind of machines that do the same thing that would plant seed. And so before you had to do it by hand, which would take a lot of, you know, workers, whatever. But now with this, you know, that basically cut a lot of workers out. And so that's why they had to move to the cities. Uh, also, uh, of course, the seed drill came out in 1701. Uh, but the horse-drawn hoe was another thing he invented too uh, as well. So those are different inventions uh, that he was uh, very famous for. I do got a picture of it right here. Jethro Tull's uh, seed drill. So here he's doing it by hand, but obviously, you know, he would horse draw most of the time, of course, later. So uh, another thing that's famous as well, which I'll mention, they, of course, came up with these new kinds of um, field systems to uh, grow crops. Uh, the most famous is the Norfolk four horse system uh, that it's called. It's one of the first four field crop rotation systems that they developed, developed in England in a place called For, uh, Norfolk County. It's called, yeah, Norfolk Four Core System. It's developed by this British agriculturist and farmer named Charles Townsend, who later was called Turnip Townsend, kind of a nickname he was dubbed. And uh, this particular uh, crop rotation system would eventually replace the old three field system that they used to use in Britain, uh, and what it did was it rotated uh, nitrogen-rich plants in crops with other crops uh, to help revitalize the soil. Because when you would sometimes plant certain kinds of crops, it would take a lot of the nutrients out of the soil. Uh, so um, Townsend came up with this idea to use turnips. So that's why they call him Charles Turnip Townsend, uh, basically. I think he was a gardener, too talk people into doing gardening and stuff like that as well. And so you can see how they would rotate the crops. So on one field, you'd have barley. Field two, you'd have turnips. Field three, you'd have wheat. And field four, you might have clover or whatever. So it could be different things that they would grow there. And um, you can see they would use the, the turnips were used to feed cattle, you know, clover and rye grass and other things would be used to, to feed other cattle and sheep and so on. Uh, and then the manure, I guess, from the uh, animals, you know, would help to re-fertilize the soil uh, and stuff like that. So so anyway, so of course now they use like natural, fer like other fer chemical type fertilizers now that they got as well. But that was an example of that, of course, going on overall. So yeah, the Norfolk uh, four course uh, road to crop rotation system. Was, that's really good there. Uh, other things I'll kind of go through real quick. I don't think I've got pictures of that, but uh, John Deere, I usually mention about him. He, he was, of course, an American manufacturer, inventor, and uh, his company, of course, the John Deere company, would later, of course, develop a lot of farming equipment and implements that were used. And Deere was the first to develop the first mass-produced cast steel plow came out in 1837. And um, so his, his, his farming company was pretty important, John Deere. And they would later produce other things like tractors and other combines and other machines that help with farming. 
Cyrus McCormick, you may have heard of him, also another American manufacturer. He had a company called International Harvester, which used to be around for years. He was one of the first to mass produce mechanical reapers for harvesting. He also developed mechanical threshers uh, to separate the grain from the stalk uh, and all that. So that's the kind of stuff they had initially. A lot of these were horse drawn, of course, you know, in the beginning. And later they went to like, you know, I guess steam or gasoline powered type machines uh, over time. Use of fertilizer, which I already talked about. Manure chemicals start coming about. Selective breeding, I told you about, becomes the norm overall. Like I said, in England, they began to grow a lot of sheep. Like England, Scotland, like everywhere. There's sheep everywhere, uh, you know, for, for the wool industry and all that. Uh, and uh, there was a joke in England that it, sheep ate men. <laughs> Not that they ate them, but they ate their livelihood uh, because it doesn't take a lot of men to tend sheep. You think about it. So a lot of men, they couldn't work farming and raising cattle and stuff like that much. So they had to leave leave the countryside and go to the city to find jobs. So, And, uh, of course, the um, we study about the uh, Industrial Revolution. Uh, it led to a lot of innovations, of course, in the Industrial Revolution. Of course, I'll get to textiles. Textiles you study about it was one of the first major industries that really took off in the industrial revolution that and coal those two things just more like mining uh and um that became big because um the the population boom they need more more you know cloth to make cloth you know you know to make clothes and so that became the big industry so those are your big industries that started first so you got the textiles with cloth making wool cotton linen made from the flax plant those are the big ones also hemp it's made to make like bags and baskets and other things like that and coal there's kind of a question between textiles and coal i think those are the first two but coal eventually replaced wood is the main kind of fuel or coke, which is kind of similar, of course, to coal as well. Iron and steel industries, of course, big. Petroleum chemical industries become big later. Shipbuilding was also big. England and other countries uh, as well, which would also require wood and later steel uh, as well uh, over time. But I'm going to first talk about, of course, uh, uh, textile manufacturing, because that's one of the things that really started initially, you know, because of the population booms. Uh, like I said, England, Scotland, of course, had to develop a lot of textile factories and mills uh, to produce a, a lot of cloth. And they had to come up with new ideas uh, to manufacture the cloth a lot faster. And so they developed a lot of new mechanical devices and machines that really did that uh, to, of course, create uh, cloth. And I'll kind of go kind of go through quickly a few examples of some of these machines that uh, of course, came out. The first was John Kay's flying shuttle. They always talk about that one first, 1730s. John Kay was an English ex-watch. I think he made watches or something like that, and he made this new um, machine. And uh, it was like a, a early um, type of uh, loom, loom type device. A loom is what they call a, a machine that creates cloth, a uh, weaving type machine. And it was one of the first that revolutionized the cloth industry. It uh, made a lot faster. It cut time in half. Um, it only took one person to actually manufacture it, uh, which a lot of workers weren't happy about at first. But because a lot of industries were at home, originally, if you know about this, women making cloth and so on. And so that would later lead to these machines being used, of course, in factories. Uh, then the one they talked about in the video, which became, you know, the one that really revolutionized everything, I guess they say, was the so-called spinning jenny developed in the 1760s. Yeah, James Hargreaves. Uh, the uh, spinning jenny was the first multi-spindle spinning frame, a uh, type of loom, which used a spinning wheel, which you can see. Now, that, that enabled it to spin cloth a lot faster, at least eight times, up to eight times faster and conventional loom weavers. Uh, and um, I think there was some even faster than that. I forget there was somewhere it was like way faster, like maybe 
you know, could I think spin up to 100 threads at once or something like that, uh, more or less. Some of these are still around. They still use them, like the spinning Jenny uh, and other, others as well. Uh, another one was the so-called um, water frame, uh, which came out. Water frame uh, is in interesting, developed by Richard Arkwright. Uh, and uh, this one was the first one that used like water power. Was, uh, this guy Arkwright in England decided that they could use these for manufacturing, like mass producing cloth. And so um, Arkwright was one of the first to incorporate textile mills. So he built some of the first textile mills in England, which started in the 1770s. They started building these factories for this. Uh, and uh, they use like water power, using like water wheels to produce the horsepower, I guess, to run them, uh, basically. You know, like I said, a lot of workers didn't like all these new machines, like women working at home and all that. And so there was cases where some some uh, workers would even sabotage them, like try to destroy them uh, and stuff like that. And um, the word sabotage came from the word sabot or sabot, I guess, which is the uh, it was like an old French word for what they call a wooden shoe that people would wear. They would throw the wooden shoes in the machines to try to break them, stuff like that. Yeah, they use like um, like water wheels or water turbines, which have been around forever. I'll just mention this briefly, but they had one called the spinning mule. It was like a hybrid of the uh, flying shuttle and the spinning jenny. It was actually very popular, which was made by Samuel Crompton in England in the 1770s. And that one supposedly was one of the most popular machines uh, before the power loom came in, which I won't talk much about the spinning spinning um, mule, but the power loom was the machine that really became the most famous. It was developed by Edmund Cartwright. You can see it's one right there. It's a kind of a modern one being used still today. It's developed in the 1780s. It was one of the first looms to use steam power. Uh, and they also later used electrical power, obviously. And it's one of the most effective, efficient ones that was, of course, produced they still use it today. Uh, the power loom is still used in the manufacturing of cloth. But you didn't know that. Uh, but it's like one of the, I guess it's the revolution, of, I mean, the evolution of these machines uh, over time. And you can see it can mass produce a lot of cloth, uh, you can see, to to make, of course, clothes. So, so anyway, that's kind of what you're looking at with the so-called power loom. Uh, then there's one more, uh, of course, that's kind of maybe now controversial now. That's the uh, famous cotton gin, which was developed by the American inventor uh, named Eli Whitney, who was from Maine. Uh, and um, this one, uh, of course, revolutionized uh, cotton manufacturing. And um, Whitney uh, came up with this idea in the 1790s, uh, which would use a machine to remove the cotton seed mechanically. Uh, from the cotton bull, which before that cotton was real expensive to make in the 18th century. Um, it was, you had to do it by hand, really take the seed out and all this. And so with this new machine, that's a small version of a cotton gin. They have large ones that are huge that they would, you know, separate the seed from the cotton. And uh, what happened was it made cotton such a popular commodity in the world that they joked that, like, at least in the United States, in the South, they said King, they talked about King Cotton. Uh, he had all these plantations that would produce a lot of cotton where they, where a lot of men became millionaires, uh, you know, selling it. And um, it eventually surpassed wool. It was one of the main things they make cloth out of over time. And most cotton comes from Egypt, India, United States, and other countries. Uh, however, like the video said, it led to the popularity of increased slavery to, you know, to pick the cotton and remove the seed and all that. And they think it was one of the major causes of why the American Civil War broke out, you know, because of, you know, the different types of labor that were used in the North and the South. The North was, was had paid labor and the South had slavery. And so a lot of it was over, over labor, uh, the reason why, why it happened. So kind of talking about the, um, 19th century textile industry. Now I'm going to go on and move on and talk about the industrial revolution. Now there was a lot of different inventions 
They were big uh, in the Industrial Revolution. The biggest invention they always talk about uh, is this famous steam engine that came about uh, in the late uh, in the 18th century, steam engine is considered to be the most famous invention that was created in the 18th century. They think it was the most famous invention of the first industrial revolution because it revolutionized so many different industries uh, overall. Uh, and the study about the early steam engine, which was called a uh, the original name that they called a steam engine, was called an atmospheric steam engine, and they were originally used to remove water. They would collect on the bottom of mine shafts. It was a big, big problem they had. So they had to remove the water by converting the water into steam and bring it up to the surface. Well, this guy named Thomas Newcomen created a machine in 1712 called the Newcomen engine. It was considered one of the first steam engines uh, that was ever made, uh, but it was impractical. It didn't work well, and it kept breaking down. And so this man named James Watt came along. He was a Scottish inventor and engineer, uh, and he took the Newcomen engine and he developed his own version of it in 1769, uh, which became known as, they call it the Watt steam engine is usually the common name. Probably called the Watt engine for short too as well. And this engine would go on to eventually in the 1800s revolutionize other fields. Uh, and, Early steam engines uh, had only like 10 horsepower. <laughs> like I think the first one that came out, which was really not that great. Uh, but if you say about by the 1880s, a lot of these steam engines uh, could put out about 10,000 horsepower or whatever. So you can see that really revolutionized. You know, the terms um, horsepower and electrical watt are kind of attributed to uh, James Watt, like Watt talked about how many horses his engine was compared to and all that. And then they talk about electrical Watt later, which was named after him as well, like kilowatts and all that uh, come from, of course, his name. But like a lot of the early ones were primitive. And then over time, the engines got better and better and better, uh, you know. Uh, and um, Watt, by the way, James Watt became very, he became very wealthy uh, selling these, a lot of these machines and they say he was one of the first wealthy people that kind of emerged from the early part of the, of the first industrial revolution at the time. Uh, also, they got other uh, benches, of course. So the steam engine then went towards an other, uh, other things like you have the steam ship or what they call the steam boat. So you've got Robert Fulton would come out with, of course, one of the first um, ships that, Trans that, that you know went towards using steam, like high pressure type steam engines, what they would use on a lot of these new innovations. And um, he built the first steamship that was called the well, they call it the Claremont, you can see there, but the original name that they actually called it uh, is called the North River Steamer. It's actually the real name of it. A lot of people call it the Claremont for some reason. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, he built it up in the Northeast. And the original type of um, steam engines, uh, steamships or steam boats were called, were used what they call paddle wheels, which you can see and that, that was with his ship was in the middle of the ship. You can see some are in the middle and then some are on the stern on the back. I think the steam, steam boats that had it on the back were called a stern wheeler. Uh, and so... By the 1800s, like in America, as an example, they had steamboats all over the place, like on the Mississippi River, et cetera, uh, going up and down the river. Oh, also, uh, Robert Fulton was famous for developing one of the first submarines, which in the old days, they didn't call them submarines. They called it a submersible. Uh, and you can see, the first one was built, it's called the, yeah, the Nautilus, which you can see there. Uh, and uh, the Nautilus, you can see, was fitted with a propeller, uh, which a lot of ships will have later. Uh, so he, he, he kind of developed that. And I think he was going to sell that to Napoleon or something like that to fight against the British uh, in the later Napoleonic Wars. But Napoleon never bought it. Uh, but I know during the American Civil War, like the Confederate side developed some submersibles, try to block the Union blockade to end, to end, the, excuse me, end the Union blockade. 
I think it was H.L. Hunley as an example that was a famous early submersible that actually sunk a ship, uh, believe it or not. Uh, then, of course, you may have heard about the locomotive. That's, of course, one of the most famous things that was developed, especially by the second Industrial Revolution later. Uh, that was originally developed in the early 1800s by a man named Richard Trevithick. Uh, he was an English engineer. He built the first locomotive around 1804. That's a replica of it, which the first locomotive ever built had a name, nickname. It was called Catch Me Who Can. It was very slow. It was only like six miles per hour uh, was how fast it was, but it could pull 25 tons. That's pretty amazing at the time. Uh, of course, ran on iron rails, later steel rails, later. Uh, and over time, you know, uh, the locomotives, like all of them, will later by the 1800s be called, a, called an iron horse because they're made of iron mostly. And they were kind of similar to like a horse. Hey, come on in, Alexandra. Um, now, let's see. Um, so we're talking about the Industrial Revolution right now. Now, uh, other, other famous industrialists that were very important in the Industrial Revolution was a man named George Stevenson. Uh, I don't have a picture of him, but here, of course, are some different locomotives that were built uh, by his influence. And uh, George Stevenson uh, was a famous uh, English engineer, uh, and also an inventor. He was kind of like a, a rail, early railroad uh, magnet to industrialist. And uh, George Stevenson was famous for building the first major railroad in the world. Uh, it's called the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. Uh, it was built to connect those two major cities uh, in England. It was finished in 1830. Uh, and so that influenced like England or you know, Scotland and all that to start building railroads all over their country and other countries would later follow as well in Europe, you know, America, uh, et cetera. And um, Stevenson came up with this thing called the standard gauge, you know, which is a type of rail system they used. It's also called the Stevenson gauge. It's a type of rail system where the rails on the track are four feet wide and eight and a half inches. That's how wide they are, four foot, eight and a half inches wide. And of course, today, a majority of railroads use that kind of gauge, a standard gauge rail system. Like if you go nearby, you can take a measuring, I guess take a measurement out and measure it or whatever. It's going to be that length still uh, today. Uh, some use what they call a narrow gauge type rail system, which is a little narrower. Uh, they do that some places. I, know. I think in Alaska, they have some, I think, of been on before, but very few use that as much. I think two thirds or more pretty much use the so-called standard gauge type of rail. Uh, George Stevens also had a son named Robert Stevens. They kind of helped, they built a comp. they had a company called the Robert Stevenson, I think locomotive company or something like that. It was called in England and they started building like a lot of these early new locomotives and supposedly the rocket, which really is sun built, Robert Stevenson, it's built in 1829, was supposedly the first major locomotive that was ever constructed that a lot of people copy later. Like the design of it is kind of similar to a lot of other locomotives uh, where the, I guess the wheels in the back are larger, the wheels being smaller in the front and all that. It's got the smokestack coming out uh, mm -hmm. and all that. Doesn't look like later locomotives, but uh, it'll look like the other ones later in um a lot of early locomotives, of course, used wood and coal, you know, it's pretty much as the main source of fuel. So you got the um, steam locomotives that they're called. Now they have diesel, of course, which has been replaced with, you know, steam locomotives. That's standard today. Uh, also, uh, in the um, Industrial Revolution, they had the so-called Bessemer process that was developed by... Um, Henry Bessemer. Henry Bessemer was a um, English industrialist in steel manufacturing in England, and he became one of the first to produce steel. They put it in these huge furnaces you see there in the picture, and they uh, would convert molten pig iron, like raw iron, uh, into steel by putting like 
carbon oxidation into it uh, to make what they call carbon uh, carbonized iron, which is what steel is. And it's much stronger, doesn't rust, you know, like, as much like iron does. Uh, and this was a very big innovation. Uh, they later call it the so-called um, Bessemer process. And the uh, furnaces were called a Bessemer converter, is usually what they call it, usually. Uh, and, um, you know, like it says there, you know, um, the Bessemer process uh, would change everything in the world, like manufacturing, you know, all the things that are built today, whether it would be cars and ships and so on, uh, would use steel, you know, body your buildings. You know, without steel, you wouldn't be able to build a skyscraper and things like that. Uh, so Bessemer changed everything. Uh, Andrew Carnegie you may have heard of him, who uh, was famous in the United States for his um, his steel corporation. Um, would borrow a lot of ideas, of course, from Henry Bessemer, which would later lead to U.S. Steel, which was the first major corporation in the world. Um, Bessemer also was called the Man of Steel because he was one of the first to kind of mass produce steel. But steel's been around, but it's, it hadn't been mass produced until really the 1800s. And, of course, steel also totally changed warfare uh, also as well. Uh, then they also talk about, uh, here's, of course, a picture of one that's a huge Bessemer converter I'm talking about. So they still make these, these have these huge furnaces that still, you know, produce steel. And so they would, create this molten steel and then they pour it out and make whatever they want out of it. Um, now you had also telecommunications. That's also another big thing that's important in, you know, the industrial revolution, you start seeing new kinds of telecommunications, telegraph, telephone, you know, wireless radio, radio, those are going to be the big inventions that are going to take off that totally change everything. Uh, the first is Samuel Morse. Now, Morse didn't exactly invent uh, the telegraph. It was invented by multiple people. I think it was even Charles Wheatstone. You may have heard of in England. That kind of contributed as well. But Morse is mostly known, Samuel Morse, for developing one of the first single wire telegraph. Um, uh, and I think the guy that developed the multi one was Thomas Edison. I think Edison had one a telegraph that could send four messages four messages at the same time it's pretty amazing um like i'm streaming at two sites right now so kind of like that so um so what it would do these the telegraph would send these electric messages using po pulses like co code pulses which uh use the famous uh dit uh, dot dot and dash morse code message system of course that he developed uh that's very famous and so it was developed in the 1830s, and then, you know, by the mid to late 19th century, everybody was using telegraphs pretty much. And uh, the telegraph was like the cutting edge of technology at the time. Like people that were telegraph operators uh, that knew the code and all that were kind of like these IT guys now working with like computers and code, you know, computer code and all that stuff. It's kind of like the comparable of that uh, today. Uh, then, oh, also, um, where is he right here? Um, yeah, Googly Elmo. I guess I'll mention him since he's in the thing uh, right now. He'd help develop. He's on the left there, that picture right there, Googly Elmo Marconi. He was Italian or American, Italian American inventor and engineer. He came over from Italy in the late 19th century, and uh, he was one of the, the pioneers in long distance radio transmission which they call radio or also called wireless telegraph or wireless telegraphy. Uh, and um, so they figured out that they could use radio waves to send messages to people, uh, et cetera. That led to also radio, like you listen to do on your, you know, your car or whatever. Uh, and um, he had his own company too. It was called the Marconi Company or Marconi Wireless Company, uh, which I think founded in the 1890s. And uh, if you wanted to send a message to people, uh, it was called a Marconi gram <laughs> or something like that. Uh, also, I'll mention too, while I'm at it, uh, because of the you know wireless telegraphy uh, that developed in the late 19th century, you, you've probably heard of Western Union, right? Uh, today, they were one of the first to really monopolize 
uh, the telegraph industry. Uh, they went on to be one of the first major corporations that would also form in, in the United States in the 19th century as well. I think that and the U.S. Steel, I think they're the, some of the first famous corporations uh, you really hear about, more or less. Uh, also, um, I need to talk about as well, you've probably heard of, everybody's heard of Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, he, of course, is very famous. He's, of course, really from Canada, although I think he came from uh, from Britain originally, but he came from, uh, lived in Canada and then came to America, like where Philadelphia is. And uh, in the 1870s, he eventually invented the telephone, uh, probably considered one of the greatest inventions in the 19th century. And um, the telephone was originally going to be used to help out deaf children uh, so that they could hear, like in class. Um, but he realized that they could use it for telecommunications. And so Eventually, he had his own company called the Bell, uh, the Bell Telephone Company, which he founded in 1877. And that eventually went on to monopolize you know, the telephone industry. That spread around the world. Uh, you know, now telephones, you can even get internet and email or, and stuff like that with cell phones. And so that's pretty much the, you know, uh, the evolution of the telephone. And you can see that's actually Bell right there on the right there. Uh, with the first telephone he ever made. That's like the first one originally. All right, moving on. Uh, let me also talk about uh, another famous, uh, of course, when you're talking about um, the um, second industrial revolution anyway, you've got to talk about Thomas Edison. Edison, of course, is considered one of the most famous uh, individuals that really, influenced the industrial revolution like the second one anyway because he had a lot of inventions but you can see like over 1300 patents at one point that changed people's lives like the way people live imagine if you didn't have light you know and things like that you wouldn't be able to read anything like at night or something like that or during the day even and um edison was called the wizard of menlo park he was called this because he had this workshop he developed in new jersey where he and his scientists would make a lot of things, uh, a lot of different patents and inventions, more or less. And of course, all the people thought it was magic. All these inventions were just, you know, magic. You know, they made them, but they weren't. They were time consuming. It took, you know, a lot of hours uh, to make make inventions. And I think Edison once remarked that, like, he didn't make like the light bulb. Or I forgot what it was he was talking about, some invention like the light bulb. But I didn't make the light bulb. I just invented ways not to invent the light bulb, you know, because it took so many different methods to figure out how to do it. Or what did he say? He said uh, that his inventions were 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. You know, those are little things he would say. And uh, But those are some of his great inventions, like the light bulb. Do you see there a picture of him with it? Uh, is really considered to be his greatest invention, the in, incandescent light bulb, I guess they called it. Uh, but that's his great invention. I think it invented around the 1870s, I think, when it came out. Uh, phonograph also was something he uh, invented. Um, in fact, he produced the first song that was ever recorded, which is uh, Mary Has a Little Lamb, which with him singing it. <laughs> So uh, movie projector, I think practically that, you know, Edison was the guy that started pretty much Hollywood. He even made the first movie, uh, which is called The Great Train Robbery uh, as well. Uh, Edison also helped to power a lot of cities with electric electric light, electric power. That's something he did, like, like he electrified New York City as an example. He even had his own in electrical industrial type company he developed, which was, I think, called the Thomas Edison Electric Light Company. I think it was called. Later, they changed the name to General Electric or GE, and that's his company uh, originally. I think it's now it's a corporation, uh, more or less. Uh, other things that, were, of course, were famous, uh, I'll mention too as well. Um, let me go ahead. Uh, I've got some other stuff I can also talk about. Uh, that was big. I need to talk about the Wright brothers. I have that too. I usually kind of mention them uh, while, while I'm at it. Uh, yeah, the Wright brothers, of course, very famous. Uh, of course, they were the ones that produced the first practical airplane, um, you know, which totally revolutionized 
the Industrial Revolution. It came at the end of the second Industrial Revolution. And um, Orville and Wilbur Wright were from Ohio. Uh, they were actually these guys that were bicycle mechanics. They had a bicycle shop. Bicycles were becoming a big craze in, in the world uh, between the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. And they heard about gliders. Uh, and so uh, they decided to uh, build their own plane. Uh, and um, eventually uh, they built this plane called the Wright Flyer. It was dubbed. I think they built several of them at one point. They went to North Carolina on the East Coast, you know, on the Atlantic Ocean, which is real windy. They started testing gliders at first, and then they, they flew the first Wright Flyer plane, of course, in 1903. And that's why North Carolina has all its license plates, you know, about that first in flight, because they were successful uh, in flying the first airplane. And that, of course, later went on to, you know, totally revolutionize, you know, air transportation, commercial-wise, uh, also in warfare uh, and stuff like that within so many years, uh, of course, after that. Uh, also, one more I'll talk about that's very famous. Of course, in the video, they talked about Henry Ford uh, as being also very important as well. Henry Ford, of course, did not invent the automobile. It was actually invented uh, by, I think, the Germans invented the automobile, like Mercedes-Benz, if you know about that. But Ford was known for being one of the first to manufacture automobiles like mass producing them and using like an assembly line. His, you know, Ford Motor Company in Detroit, Michigan uh, became very famous. And a lot of other companies copied him. Uh, they think the assembly line idea was an idea he got from Thomas Edison. He was influenced by Edison a lot. And um, how his assembly line worked was that his workers would basically only build a, a, per, a, a, a certain part of the car. So yet one person building, you know, putting the engine in, somebody painting it, somebody would put put the wheels on, you know, and they go down the line. Uh, and the uh, one of the first uh, automobiles, of course, that was mass produced was the Model T. T. I think he first actually started producing it around 1910. I know it was. Uh, but eventually by 1927, I do know that they had produced like 20, 30 million of them, 27 million, some crazy number. I think they were building over a million of them uh, a year. Uh, and um, originally they just originally they just painted the cars black. I don't know if you know about that. I think a long time ago they used to paint them black just to so they wouldn't rust <laughs> and stuff like that. And so the joke was um, you can get in any color as long as it was black. Uh, and I think the, um, the Model T was often called the Tin Lizzie. It was like a tin can on wheels. A lot of early, early automobiles were really cheap. You can get it for like 900 some dollars uh, for a car at one point, but that was still a lot of money back in those days. But the automobile is important because it totally revolutionized transportation throughout the world. You could basically go anywhere, anytime, you know, uh, you aren't set on a timetable, you know, to get on a ship or a plane or, um, or a train. You, know, really, you just drive down the road, go wherever you want, as long as you have roads, uh, more or less. Now, uh, let me uh, talk about for a few minutes. Um, just, uh, of course, I want to get into um, which time I almost out of time. I got a few minutes left. I can talk some more. Uh, but um, now I want to get into, of course, the rise of socialism. I need to talk about that today uh, a little bit. Now, um, of course, the Industrial Revolution had negative sides uh, to it. And of course, I'm talking about all the positive sides, you know, but the, of course, poor working conditions, living conditions, those are the kind of things that workers had to go through uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Of course, they uh, think it was, who was that guy that once said it? Uh, the William Blake, I think he was the guy that described England, some of the different factories as being dark, satanic mills, low wages. They didn't, Workers, especially those who are unskilled, didn't make much money. Child labor was a problem. As long as young as five years old, working in factories and mines, long hours, like 12, 15 hours or more. No unions, no workers' compensation. If you got hurt on the job, you just lost your job, you know, basically. So um, so you had all these problems that had in the Industrial Revolution. And so it led to the rise of socialism. 
uh, that kind of counter capitalism, uh, more or less, because things weren't, I guess, moving along long enough as possible to create reforms and give workers help. And so this is something you start to see in the industrialized world in the West, this kind of thing between should we have capitalism as our main economy or should we go to socialism, uh, more or less. And um, socialism is kind of hard to define what it is, uh, but basically it's a type of um, economic, political, and social system uh, that became a rival uh, to capitalism. Uh, the term came about in the 1800s, uh, more or less. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of people don't like socialism. Uh, they always hear that term and they go, Ugh, I don't know about that. Uh, and um, but socialists advocate complete control of the economy. They want like a government or maybe even the people having more control uh, over the means of production, uh, the industries of uh, themselves. Uh, and they also, in some cases, uh, they don't want private ownership over it. They want the state uh, to control things. Not even in some cases, like with communism, they even want to take people's private property. You can't own anything uh, under true socialism, uh, they say. Uh, and um, early socialists socialist that developed were in France and England and the, also the United States. A lot of the early socialists were called utopian socialists. They were called this because they were kind of considered naive, and uh, they also developed these utopian societies where everybody wanted to live like the Amish, you know, living at least the farming communities. The Amish are kind of like that. The Amish are kind of like, it's almost like a form of socialism, but they called it cooperative socialism, where they would live in farming communities or farming cooperatives is what they called them. And um, under utopian socialism, everybody was equal, including women. Yeah, women, men and women were all considered equal. So, so men weren't better than women. Women had a right to vote and other things like that, which didn't exist uh, at the time. And even all the economic planning that would go on with this this utopian society or whatever would all, you know, involve not just men but women, you know, also as well. Um, now, the utopian socialists were controversial. You know, to later socialists, they rejected the whole class struggle thing. Uh, which is, you know, the whole main basis of Marxism, uh, which comes out later that they, there should be some kind of social revolution. Uh, and so the utopian socialists were kind of, they were kind of moderate. Uh, they weren't as more to the left uh, as later socialists are. Because uh, I think a lot of socialists are considered liberal or even radical, like the communists, uh, that of course, uh, later. Uh, these were some examples of early utopian socialists. Henry St. Simon, Charles Fourier, of course, in France, uh, George Ripley and Robert Owen in England, uh, I think were examples of those. And they even do up these utopian societies you may have heard about. Uh, New Harmony, I think, was in Indiana, was in the United States. Brook Farm was one that was in uh, Massachusetts. Oneida Society in New York. Uh, so these are all examples of utopian societies that kind of came about as early forms of socialism. Oneida was famous, by the way, for... That one later didn't work out. You know about that? It kind of collapsed later. They started making silverware. I mean, we're Oneida company that used to make silverware and plates. <laughs> Just kind of fun, because I've got some at home still, but I've got utopian <laughs> Oneida silverware. It's kind of weird. Um, now, in the 1840s, there was a man named Karl Marx, who I think everybody's heard of, of course, Marx. Uh, and um, Marx came about uh, and uh, he he would replace utopian socialism with what they call Marxism. And Marxism is a different brand of socialism. It's like a um, scientific socialism is kind of what it would be. Uh, if you look it up, it's hard to define because it's got all kinds of definitions of what it is. But it's all based on the philosophy of Karl Marx, who lived in the 19th century. Karl Marx was a German philosopher. He was a socialist. Uh, he was an economist. I think he was also an historian. He wrote historical works also as well. And uh, most of his theories, if you know about Marxism, are based on a book he wrote, well, really a pamphlet he wrote, 1848, called The Communist Manifesto, which he wrote with Frederick Engels, who was a fellow socialist. He also wrote another book later called Das Kapital, which heavily criticized capitalism. 
Yeah, but the Communist Manifesto is more famous worldwide. It's, of course, considered to be the Bible of, com of, of communism and, of course, socialism as well. Uh, and so a lot of people view Marx and his theories as being uh, the, the guy that was the father of socialism and communism today. Uh, and um, Marx had different theories about capitalism. He believed that capitalism would eventually decline and that it would collapse like over time. Uh, and he thought that mostly why it would decline would be because of the social struggle or class struggle that was going on within capitalism. There's different social classes that are part of it. And he thinks that internal warfare uh, between the classes will eventually cause it to implode uh, over time. You may have heard about this, uh, that there's two kinds of main classes uh, that are within capitalism. You've got what he called the capitalists. The capitalists is what he called the bourgeoisie, which were the upper middle class uh, that emerged out of the end of the um, feudal period and into the industrial revolution period. And uh, they were the ones that owned all the factories and the businesses. They control the means of production. They control the industries, the captains of industry and all that. Versus the proletariat, which is a term he uses for the working class peoples, the lower classes. And these are the people that are earning wages, that are working for the people that own the industries, more or less. Marx believed that what would happen over time was that a wealth gap and, and inequities between both of the classes will call what will cause a social revolution, which he also calls a workers' revolution. And he believes that what's going to happen eventually is that it'll overthrow capitalism. So that that's in a nutshell what Marx believed what would happen over time, that capitalism would fail. And then what would happen because of revolutionary socialism. It would create a stateless, classless, moneyless society. They'd get rid of all that. No classes, no states, no countries, no even no money. Sounds like Star Trek or something like that. And um, however, what happened over time was that this brand of socialism, with, which he envisioned, didn't happen that way. It became more like hybrid versions of it uh, that would kind of follow after Marx would die. And so you'd have things like Marxism, Leninism would kind of come about first. That was kind of considered one of the first ones that you've heard about before, which started in Russia with the Soviet Union. That's what they call communism originally. And this is like a totalitarian version of Marx's theories, which were influenced by Vladimir Lenin and also Stalin. Uh, and it was more totalitarian because it led to a lot of uh, oppression of the people that didn't want it. And of course, it led to a lot of people getting killed. Because, uh, you know, communism killed a lot of people worldwide. I think 100 million people, I think it killed total. Maoism also, the People's Republic of China, was also a similar version uh, to Marxism, Leninism as well, developed by Mao Zedong, heard of him probably, I'm hopefully, founder of Communist China in the 1949. And um, so they have their own version too, um, also as well. Other countries embraced it too, North Korea, Vietnam, Cuba, all kind of followed similar models as well, communism. But you see today, a lot of them are kind of trying to move away from it, maybe except North Korea. Uh, but most of them are trying to move away towards more like market capitalism and all that. But a lot of their governments are still communist, you know, pretty much. Uh, you go there. Uh, also, don't forget, of course, the big thing that came out of Marx's theories was democratic socialism. That became the more popular form of socialism that rejected the communist version, of course. And this became more of a mix of like moderate style socialism, uh, which would be like with the government. Uh, and then they had capitalism still that they have. So it's kind of a mixed economy of both socialism and capitalism. And that's something you see a lot in Europe. A lot of your European countries you see that form of socialism, democratic socialism. A lot of the Nordic countries, the Nordic model, it's kind of like that. Uh, like they've got a lot of programs that help the people out, like, you know, universal health care and things like that. Um, and then the United States probably has more what they call welfare capitalism, uh, which is more of a capitalist type country, the United States uh, in the West. But we have some forms of socialism you've, of course, heard of, Social Security, Medicare, that's kind of like a, like a form of socialism uh, in a sense. 
Uh, but the United States is more of a capitalist state uh, still today. But Marx, of course, changed everything. You know, Marx um, probably, you know, uh, is one of those individuals that changed the world quite a lot, you know, from some of these theories that he came with. Of course, some of the people think it's like pie in the sky theories that will never really work like he wanted uh, originally. They've kind of taken hybrid versions of it, um, more or less. So anyway, uh, that's probably it for today. I'm not going to have time to review today, but I think what next time I'll, I'll review over the 19th century um, material um, on, I think, Tuesday next week. Uh, and then I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to start on getting into World War One. I. I'm gonna, I'm, I need to move on to get, get to 20th century because I know we're behind. We only got a few weeks left of, of lectures uh, here to go. Uh, so that's what my plan is next week. But like I said, don't forget to finish up on some of those Canvas quizzes I got posted. Uh, I think you got the one on the Waterloo uh, video quiz to do. Also the one on the um, French Revolution, Napoleon Canvas quiz. And then, I, like I said, I have posted the second exam uh, for you to go ahead and work on and get that done by the end of next week. Uh, and so later I am going to post this lecture to my YouTube channel. So uh, if you got any questions about this lecture or not, let me know. Um, and that's it. But I know it's a little longer lecture. I was trying to cram in that socialism part. But that's it for, for, for today. I uh, hope you all have a good weekend coming up. I guess everybody's okay after the storm and all that. Uh, but that's it. So you all take care. I'll, of course, see you all later.